What's up guys, I'm Ira Rochelle and this is The End Times. I've been hearing a lot of talk about the Euphrates River recently. Most of the talk is about my favorite book, Revelation. So let's just read those verses real quick. Revelation chapter 9, verse 13 through 16. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet and I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. Now, I don't want to go too, too deep into this, but let's just build a quick foundation. The first block we need to lay is the time period that this happens. If you notice, the first thing that John records is that this is the event of the sixth trumpet. Now, many will say, why is this important? Who cares? Others will say, that proves nothing because they know exactly where I'm going with this. According to Revelation chapter 8, there are seven trumpets that will be blown in the last days, which we are currently in, and I'm, I'm just throwing that in there. And if you don't believe me that we are in the last days, let's read Acts chapter 2 verses 17 through 21. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I, and I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the lord comes the great and magnificent day and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the lord shall be saved it's in the last days that god pours out his spirit that's the giving of the holy spirit it's in the last days that anyone who calls upon the name of the lord shall be saved therefore if we aren't in the last days, then you can't say that the day of Pentecost, where God poured out his spirit on all flesh, that that happened 2,000 years ago in the upper room, right? You can't say then that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved unless it's the last days. For more on us being in the last days, check out our video, Are We in the Last Days?, which is under our The End Times category. So with that said, these are the last days that those seven trumpets spoken of in Revelation chapter 8 will take place. And why is this important? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 through 53 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. According to Paul, the last trumpet is the rapture of the church, when those who are dead will be raised first, and then those who are alive in Christ will be caught up to meet them and Christ in the air. This is the rapture of the church, the seventh and final trumpet. This takes place after the Great Tribulation. Matthew 24, chapter 29 through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. According to Jesus himself, the rapture takes place immediately after the Great Tribulation. For more on the rapture and the Great Tribulation, check out our videos, The Rapture, and our other video, The Great Tribulation, which is under our The End Times category. So this takes place during the Great Tribulation, and how can we be sure? Because the sixth trumpet is the release of Abaddon, and it's through Abaddon, the beast out of the bottomless pit, that the man of lawlessness will come to power, which will begin 
the Great Tribulation. And for all of that information, check out our videos, Who is Abaddon, the Angel of the Bottomless Pit, and the Man of Lawlessness, which are both under our The End Times category. So this hasn't happened yet, but it will happen before the rapture takes place. Now that we have a time period for when this will occur, let's move on to the identity of these four angels. I've heard a few theories on who these angels are, but the main theory I've heard is that these are the angels spoken of in Jude and 2 Peter. So let's read those two accounts real quick to compare. Jude 6, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. And 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Now, if you've watched a few of our videos, you know that these angels recorded in these two verses are the sons of God from Genesis chapter 6 that left their proper dwelling and slept with the daughters of man. And we go into great detail explaining that in our video series the sons of god which you can find under our too deep category now after reading these two verses we find a few key differences the most important difference between these angels and the angels of revelation chapter 9 is that these angels are bound until the judgment which happens not only after the rapture takes place but after the millennial reign of christ according to revelation chapter 20. And the angels of Revelation chapter 9 are released during the Great Tribulation before the rapture takes place according to Revelation 9, 13 through 14. So then, who are these four angels bound at the river Euphrates if they aren't the angels of Jude and Second Peter? Honestly, I have no idea who they are, but here are a few things that I do know. These four angels don't seem to be bound because of punishment, but bound because it just isn't their time yet. Here's what I'm talking about. Revelation chapter 9, verse 13 through 15. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Here's a couple key points. The first is that they are bound at the river Euphrates. They aren't bound at a place of punishment like Abaddon is when he's locked away in the bottomless pit according to Revelation 9, 1 through 11. We know that the bottomless pit is a place of punishment because Satan is going to be bound there for a thousand years according to Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 through 3. He's going to be in chains in the bottomless pit for a thousand years so it's not quite like that nor is it like the angels who are bound in chains of gloomy darkness and tartarus which is rendered as hell according to second peter chapter 2 verse 4 because of what they've done instead of being bound in a place of punishment because of things that they have done these angels are bound in a place of war and here's what I'm talking about, 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 29. In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. King Josiah went to meet him, and Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo as soon as he saw him. We also have 1 Chronicles 18, verse 3. David also defeated Hadadezer, king of Zobath, Hama, as he went to set up his monument at the river Euphrates. This would make sense why they're held, prepared, and then released for war at the Euphrates River. They're bound, not in chains, but bound at the Euphrates River, training for the very hour that they will be released. How do you train in chains? It just doesn't make sense to me, but I digress. Let's keep going. The River Euphrates is also a place of division or border for the promised land. Look at what God promised Abraham. Genesis chapter 15 verses 18 through 21. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites and the Jebusites. 
And now, look at what God promised Moses. Deuteronomy 11:24. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your territory shall be from the wilderness to the Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, to the western sea. So the Euphrates River isn't a place of punishment or imprisonment, but a place of dividing between what belongs to God and what belongs to the rest of the world, as well as a place of war. Now this this is starting to make sense. Well, at least it's starting to make sense to me. The second key point is that they were released to kill a third of mankind, Revelation 9, 15. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. They were released to kill a third of mankind. It doesn't say that they were released and did this. It's that they were prepared and then released to do this. The interesting thing is that the words bound and released are the same Greek words used in another popular verse. Matthew 16, verse 18 through 19. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus told Peter that he would give him the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever he bound on earth would be bound in heaven, and whatever he loosed on earth would be loosed in heaven. These are the same Greek words used in Revelation 9.15. Now, what if, and I'm not saying this is fact, I'm just throwing this thought out there, right? What if they are currently bound until the church releases them? If they aren't evil but were prepared for this very hour, then they would be good, right? So if they're good and if they're spiritual, then they would have to be released by something physical done by the church. Why? Because Psalms 115 verse 16 says, The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. Paul puts it this way. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 45 through 47, Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. This would make sense why Jesus gave the church the keys to the kingdom of God at whatever we bind or loose on this earth will be bound or loosed in heaven. In other words, what we do in the physical will manifest in the spiritual. So just because God has something in store for you, that doesn't mean that it's just going to be thrown at you. You have to do something in order to release that. Look at what James says. James chapter 4 verses 2 through 3. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Unless we make a physical action on this earth, the spiritual cannot be moved, which is why Jesus told Peter, whatever you loose, on this earth will be loosed in heaven and whatever you bind on this earth will be bound in heaven that includes blessings something has to be tied up in order for you to untie it something has to be bound in order for you to loose it something has to be loose in order for you to bind it now here's a quick side note this is also the same with Abaddon. What is done in the physical will manifest in the spiritual. A star doesn't just fall out of heaven for no reason. But that needs a video all on its own. So we'll just leave that there. All right, back to this video. I believe that there are more mysteries for these angels as well as the mounted horses. But for the sake of time, let's save that for another video. In the meantime, let's sum everything up for you guys. The four angels bound at the Euphrates River they aren't the same as the angels bound in Tartarus, recorded in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and Jude 6. The four angels are bound and released before the judgment, whereas the angels of 2 Peter 2, verse 4 and Jude 6 are released only to stand before Jesus at the last judgment. These four angels don't seem to be evil, but rather were prepared to do this very thing they were released for. In other words, this is a part of their purpose. They are bound until they are released, possibly by the church. 
and I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you did, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel. And until next time, God bless.